Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for each who have made it here. We thank you for your grace and your love that continues to fall down and pour down like the rain. We thank you for that reminder that you are real and that you love us. So we pray that this message be something that we take and apply it in our real, real world. Be with us, give us wisdom, and lead us every step of the way there. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good afternoon. You made it. You made it in a rainy afternoon, right? You made it. When, when I was a kid, I, al I always had this weird like curiosity or fascination when it came to the rain. And, and there were whenever I was a kid, I was always in the backseat, of course, and I would watch the windshield wipers, right? They would keep going and they would cle keep clearing the water. But there was this one spot. There was this one spot on the windshield. It was kind of like in this shape. And I was always wondering, I was like, man, why is it not getting that spot? I was always wondering, I, I couldn't figure it out. It just boggled my mind that everything else was being wiped except for that weird like triangle that's like an isosceles. Is that, what it, is that the correct <laughs> mathematical term? It was like a weird, and I remember it clearly when I was a kid, I actually walked up to it and I felt it to see if it was just like, a, a, like something that was real or was it something that I was just imagining. As a kid, I was very curious about how things work. Like, like I saw a post also, as a kid you would try to figure out when or why the refrigerator light would turn off, right? You're kind of watching it and you're like waiting last second and you're like, oh, okay, it's still on, it's still on, it's still on, oh, it turned off. In your head, you're like, is this time, or is it like, is there something that I'm missing? Because we don't understand how these things work. As a kid, you're, you're kind of just oblivious to, to how things work in the world. Well, today, we are going to be talking about something that is not strange. There are directions, there are, are, are things that we can look at and see that there are directions to be had. And we're talking about love. Tell your neighbor, love. It's a love one. It makes you feel good, right? Love. So we're talking about love and dating. And dating and, and finding the love, the love quest, if you would, right? There, there are these things that we're trying to understand. Well, this here has something that we can go to, right? And when I was a kid, I didn't know there was an instruction manual to the refrigerator. When I was a kid, I didn't know you could look up the user manual for any car and the wiper blades and, and, and all that. But here we know that the scripture has all the answers to all of our questions in life, right? And so we are coming from Genesis 24. <coughs> Every Bible, please turn. I'll also be reading it from here. So Genesis 24, 1 to 20. This one's a, a lengthy one, all right? So, so stretch your feet a little bit, get comfortable, and let's, let's see what this story has to say. Starts off in verse 1. And I'm going to contextualize along the way so you kind of understand what's going on. But verse 1 starts, Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. Now, retract already one verse eight. This guy's already going back. Like, this is going to be a long story. What happened before this was Abraham just lost his wife, Sarah. Right? And so they're, they're, they're referring to Abraham because he's also on his way out. Very old. Right? And as we continue, he said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living. Verse 4. But will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. You see there, it kind of just contextualized. So when God called Abram, before he was even Abraham, when God called Abram, he said, don't stay here. Go out, and I will and I will make your descendants be known. And you won't be known for staying here at home. 
you're going to go and, and I'm going to take care of you, basically, right? And so that's what Abram, who later became Abraham, did. Verse 6, or sorry, verse 5. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Abraham said, verse 6, Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household in my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me an oath, on oath saying, To your offspring, offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. As we continue, verse 8. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Verse 10. Then the servant left, taking, him, taking with him ten of his master's camels loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out from Aram, Naharim, and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening, the time the women go out to draw water. Verse 12. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown your kindness to my master. 15. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. 16. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. <coughs> Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar in the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Problem only, man. What does that have to do with dating? Right? You're like, he sent somebody to look for somebody for his son. Right? How is that really dating? The question here for us to kind of keep in mind throughout this afternoon is how this passage makes sense in dating. Okay, so keep that in your mind and as we kind of explore and see what the word says, I think you'll find your answer. So sticking with movies, I, I love movies. My wife <laughs> loves watching movies. And I kind of was digging deeper. It's crazy because what we see in movies is so little of what actually takes place during the process of filmmaking. So you see, what we possibly see is just the, the white screen or the green screen in some studios, but what we don't see are all these lights, these ladders, these cameras, these <coughs> light umbrellas. There's so much more than what we see in the picture. There's so much more. And in the story of, of Isaac and Abraham, and the servant looking, we see that God is taking the role of a producer in this movie, if you would. I'm probably wondering, what does that even mean? What does a producer actually do? And so I, I did a little research myself. I said, yeah, what, is, what does a producer do? You, you see the, the credits and you see, you see the lines moving and you don't really understand. And so I, I looked a little bit further. This is what a producer does. And that's just some. Obviously, I'm not going to read everything. But you see from pre-production, 
during production and, and even after production, post-production, there are still some things that need to take place, that need to be controlled, that need to be managed if you're a producer. You see, when we're looking at, at, this, at this story, we're, we're, we're trying to understand who the producer is in this movie. Who, who, who's in charge? But when you look a little bit further and you look a little bit deeper on what exactly is happening, we, we come to find that this is actually God produced. And so how do we, how do we find that? What, what does that look like, right? So you're, you're wondering. Let's check verse 7, what it says. This is what Abraham is telling to a servant as he's looking for the wife for Isaac. He says, the Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, to your offspring I will give this land. And he will send his angel before you so you can get a wife for my son from there. You see, the things were already in, in place before this even happened. The promise of the descendants for Isaac happened way before he was born. When you look at what, what really takes place in, in this whole story, there, there are so many things that we, that we tend to miss because we're, we're just reading what is. But there's so much more. If we, if we look at God's notes as a producer, for example, let's just see what was, what was going on. So, in the beginning, he's talking to Abram. And he's talking about, wow, you will be promised to be a great nation, right? Let's, let's read what, 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 goes up, what goes on. It says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. By the way, when Abram was 99, he became Abraham. So 99 years old, and, and this guy still got a lot of work to do. He's supposed to be the father of many nations. With his wife Sarah, who by the way is 90, she's got no kids, no dogs, no pets, no nothing. It's just her at 90. But we see what happens when the producer sets everything up. The only things that we actually have to do there is to obey. You see, as actors in, in this movie, and we're trying to, trying to figure out who's producing our movie, our, our life movie, we have to realize that God is already producing everything. All the things in the back, the ladders, the lights, the cameras, He's thought about every angle. He's thought about everything. Including, by the way, for some of us, life partners. <coughs> but as actors, sometimes we tend to make our own decisions. We make our own choices, right? Away from the script. And that happened in this story. We, we see what happened when Sarah was like, we're supposed to be a great nation, but I don't have kids. So here, try it with my, with, my, with my servant. Maybe you might get kids with my, with my servant. So she handed over Hagar, and they had Ishmael. But God's promise was not like that. It was to go through Abraham and his wife, Sarah, or Sarai at that point, right? We have to understand that the producer has already thought of all these possibilities, and all we have to do is obey what's already there. We don't have to think hard or, or, or go out on a limb because it's already planned for. It's already provided for. It's there for us already. So we look at God as the producer in our lives. And this applies to things. <coughs> You think that God sees some of our relationships and goes, oh, I didn't plan that. <coughs> or, oh, I didn't see that one coming. No, 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 no. We have to understand that the producer has seen everything. He's seen the beginning and the end, pre-production, during production, and post-production. This is no, no new thing for God. So as we see that and we get reminded of God as a producer, what next? What do we do next? 
If God is a producer, we obey what the producer has made for us, the environment, the things that he set up, we obey that. And we pray, right? We pray that we can figure out what the producer is setting up around us, that we understand the whys of the people around us, the who's, the what's. With God as the producer. So this is a very interesting screenshot. This was July 11, 2017. This was when I was praying very, very honestly to God for my wife. Let me kind of share a, a, a story with you with how this even led here in, in terms of dating. So I worked for Nike for four plus years and I was taking care of myself, paying bills, I had a car, I had an apartment, life was well and I was fairly successful at, at 23, 24 years old. I was living at the top of the world and I was, and I was telling God, God, I have everything, I just don't have a partner, what's going on? Is this your plan for me? Is this what you want for me? And so I, I kind of pushed and pushed a little bit further. And I met somebody. I met somebody and she was really athletic and she had really nice flowy hair, curly hair. And, and, and at the time I was like, wow, God, this is you. Life is well. This is what I was asking for. <laughs> and there was this weird kind of like honeymoon phase, of course, when you get into a new relationship and, and, and things are like, oh my gosh, she's awesome. Oh my gosh, she likes this. I like that too. Oh my gosh. Like, it, it's so exhilarating. And the more and more I spent time with her, the more and more I felt like this was it. This is, this is what life is going to be about. I did not see the things that were happening because of this relationship. I would be early for our dinner dates. I would be early for our lunch dates, but I was 20 minutes late for church. I would never make it to a prayer meeting, but I would be there to pick her up, drop her off. I would be there when she called me, but when my parents would call me about Alex's school events, no way. I don't have time for that. There was a lot of stuff going on. But in my head, I was just rationalizing. Right? I, I prayed for this. This is good. This is, this is what I need. So I, I kept praying for it. And I was like, God, just make it work. And then during this relationship, I got an offer to work at the headquarters of Nike, which is in Oregon. So I, they were asking me to relocate. One of my good buddies uh, was hired and he said, hey, I'd love for you to come on on board with us. We got, a, we got a headquarter position for you, and I know you do great. And in my head, I was like, yeah, me too. I, I think I, I, I do very well. But in the back of my mind, I said, oh, I just started this relationship, and it's so nice. What am I going to do? <coughs> and so I, I, I said, you know what? I, I, was, really, I was really arrogant at this, time, at this time of my life. I said, you know what, man? Hey, I don't think I'm going to take this job. Because I know if I really want it in the future, I can get it. And so, it's cool, man. Thank you for the offer. But I have a good thing going on. My, my career is not going anywhere here. So let me just stay here. And, and I'll, I'll, if I want it, I'll, I'll get it later on. Let me do my thing. So he said, okay, cool. Thanks for letting me know. Two weeks later, this girl starts just ghosting me. She is nowhere to be found. I'm texting her. I'm calling her. Nothing. I'm trying everything. She doesn't even have like a uh, WhatsApp or a Viber or Marco Polo at the time. I tried everything. She was just not returning any of my calls. <coughs> and when we got to talking, she was kind of just, it was, it's one of the most mysterious things because we, <coughs> long story short, we're good friends now, but at the time, she could not explain why. And I was just like, ugh, like I just gave up a position at headquarters for her, and now she's gone. Now the job's gone. 
And I was shattered. I was questioning God. And I said, isn't this what you wanted from me? Isn't this what you would want for, for, for someone who is your child? And as I reflected, <coughs> there was a lot of things going wrong in that relationship. And because I was not going to end it, God had to end it for me. Because he knew that there are cues in life that only the, that he would be able to see. Because we're so deep into it that we, we don't know what's going on outside of this bubble. And so as we look at this, I want you to think about God also being the director of your life. So you're asking me, what does this screenshot have to do with that story? That has nothing to do with it, right? Okay, <laughs> Let's, let's kind of revisit again. So after the heartbreak, the, the job loss, I was just broken. I didn't know what to do. And this was the time that I really honestly prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, what do you want? What do you want for me to do here? Because I don't know. Obviously, I thought I knew. But I don't. And this was when I prayed to the Lord and I asked him, take me. I'm surrendering all that I have. I don't have, I don't have anything that I want to hold back from you. Because I don't want to, I don't want to feel that again. So take it. After few conversations with, with of course, my family and, and with Pastor Butch and, and the rest of the church, we decided that seminary was my next next step. And so I left Nike altogether. Uh, I left my family. And I'll never forget what Pastor Butch told me. He said, you know, when you go to the seminary in Baguio, because he also attended this for, for a while, for a short stint, he said, pray very honestly, because the student ratio of men and women there is very lopsided. So it's like one man to four or five women student-wise. So it's like, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous environment for temptation when you go to seminary. Moreover, I was, I was going to the Philippines. And so for them, that's even a, it's, it's just a common misconception. But to them, it's like, ooh, we have an American coming. So, oh, he's got, he's got benefits. He's got all this. And so it just, I, I just become a target. And so Pastor Bush said, pray honestly, that the relationships we have there are, are serious. Not necessarily in a romantic relationship, but be intentional with the people that you talk to. Don't lead them on. Don't do anything that could possibly ruin your relationships with the people there. And so I prayed. And, you know, I was out of, away from home. I, I, was, I didn't really know anybody. My family on my dad's side was in the Philippines, but they were a few hours away from the school. So I was basically by myself at the seminary, the same place, and I didn't know anybody, and, and I was just kind of not trying to ruffle feathers because I was uh, the brash American student who, who decides to, to just go leave everything. And, you know, I, and don't worry, my wife tells these stories, so it's not like she's getting a shocker. Um, but I remember there, there were, when I saw the students, I was like, man, Pastor Butch was not playing around. There's like a lot of, there's a lot of girls compared to guys here. It's like, this could be trouble. And so I, I kept praying to God, and I said, God, please, even through the friendships, let me be honest with people. Let me, let me continue to focus on my, my purpose here at the school. And, and I prayed to him, however. I said, but Lord, if it is your will for me to find somebody here, please show me that I don't have to, to do any stupid activities or stupid choices. And so for the first two weeks, it, life moved on. Classes kept going. And one, one afternoon, I'm, I'm walking down, downstairs from class, and somebody called me to her office. And, and this was somebody that I had never met before, because for some reason, I was like, I, was like, I don't even know who she is. This is literally my first time seeing her since my, my two weeks here in the Philippines. And I was like, I was like, in my head, honestly, in my head, I thought I was in trouble 
because I, I thought I had violated some, some foreign student law or whatever it was. And so I was getting called to the principal's office. So her office was here, and the president of the school's office is here. So I'm like, okay, I'm in for it. Like, there, there's something that, 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 that's about to go down. And so she, she asked me, she says, hey, uh, I heard you used to help lead praise and worship back here at church. And I was wondering if, if you could help, help out with our team uh, in chapel. And so I was like, oh, okay, we're good, we're safe. No, they're not gonna send me home. And so, sure enough, she gave me the details. She said, look, uh, we practice on Mondays, um, chapel's on Tuesdays, so please be there. Uh, we'll, we'll set up the whole band, but you can help lead us, uh, help lead with us uh, during chapel. I said, cool, all right, solid. Uh, in my head, of course, I was like, I was like, oh, she's, she's pretty. But I didn't think about it. I, I, just, I, just kept, I just kept talking with God, and I said, I said, you know, I just met her. It's, it might be one of those like new person, like when you meet them, it's like, ooh, it's like a new, new person, and I want to get to know them. Uh, and so I was praying to God, maybe it's just, it's just new person syndrome, right? And so I, I kept, I, I showed up that Monday, and, and she is there in the chapel, and she's like setting up the mic stands, and she's making sure the music's on there. I'm like, dang, she, she's on it. Like, she's really wants us to succeed in, 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 this, in this leading of worship. Um, and the more and more I found out that she was the executive uh, assistant to the school president. And so I was like, man, she, she's like, usually just does paperwork, but she's out here, she's like sound checking, she's like <laughs> running back and forth. She's committed, this is awesome. And then, uh, but then I kept telling God, I said, I said, God, maybe, maybe I just, this is the fourth day, maybe I'm still kind of in, in that syndrome of, of, of meeting new people. Whatever, I kept pushing it to the back. And then uh, she called us, she said, hey, uh, let's pray together. I was like, man, she's so spiritual, man. She's like <laughs> leading us in prayer. She, she's getting the stage set up. She, she's on it. But then I was like, okay, maybe she, she just really loves her job, or she just really loves serving the Lord. She's passionate. And so I said, okay, cool. That, that's, that's cool. And so we finished prayer, and we're kind of like waiting for the rest of the band and the singers to come in. And then, uh, and then she grabs a mic, and she says, okay, let's go from verse 1. I'm like, okay, now she's singing with us. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is strange because she's like a, like a school staff, staff or faculty, so I was just like, okay, that's just strange altogether. Um, but she started singing, and I was to the right of her, so she was center, she was a worship lead, and I was to the right, and she sang, and there's really, <laughs> there's really not an English word to, to describe what I felt, but in Tagalog, we call it the kilik. There was like, there, it's like a feeling of like, it's not butterflies, it's not like, it's, I don't know, it's, it's like, it's weird because kilik is like, like shuddering, or like, uh, but that's not like a, like a, like a good translation. But I felt like, I was like, okay, this is kind of weird because I, I'm kind of like trying to do my best not to think about this, and not to think about her in this way, uh, but God, you know my prayer, I, I want to be honest with people, so if it's not her, Lord, stop playing around. Like, just give me peace. Like, let me just get through practice. And so on and so forth. And, and we get to talking uh, after, and, and, and all is well. And I really start to have conversations with her. I felt kind of bad. Um, because I was working at the library, and I would be, like, texting her, and I was supposed to be texting. Um, but one day, I, I text her. I said, hey, you want to go out to the movies and get to know each other? Mm -hmm. Um, and by the way, I met her parents and all this, so we were fairly close friends at this point. And so I'd asked her, I said, do you want to go out to, to watch a movie? And at the time, and you could look this up, uh, on the weekend of July, this weekend, July 11, 2017, <laughs> three, so, in Baguio, there's only, they only show, there's only one movie theater, they only show three, three movies. And so the movies at the time were Transformers The Last Night, I believe, Despicable Me 3, and Spider-Man Far, Far From Home? Wait, Far From Home. Homecoming? I think it was Homecoming, sorry. It might be Homecoming. So these were the three movies that I asked her, and I remember because I was in the library. Then. I say, could you give me a number between 1 to 30? 
And in my head, and I told her, I was like, the closest one you guess, that's the one we'll go watch. And so obviously I have one in the middle, closer to the middle. I have one closer to the end, and then one closer to the beginning. And without hesitation, she said, number 17. And I was like, okay. I was like, a little strange, but that's fine. Well, rewind the story. When I met her dad, uh, who is a missionary pastor, so he, he's, he's all over the place and he gets to share the gospel. He told me, son, I want you to enjoy your friendship together first and get to know each other and, and don't be serious, but I thank you for, for talking to me and kind of making sure that your intentions were clear. He said, one thing you have to look for are signs in, in, in this relationship. And I was like, signs? Like this guy, I'm talking about signs. And I was like, this, what is it? What can be? What can he be talking about? Papa Ed, I love you if you're watching. Um, but he was like, science. And I was like, no way. That's like some old, old folklore of, of science. And, and I kind of wasn't understanding. And so this was the first sign. And so a couple weekends later, I, I traveled to Manila. And I'm helping serve a church there. And one of our uh, good church members, Nicolo, who, who's, who I'm helping serve at the time, we go out and meet Chow King, and he knows who she is because he also went to the same seminary at, at some point. And we are going out, and we uh, just have breakfast, and, and we order our food, and the number I get is 17 again. I'm like, all right, this is just kind of weird. <laughs> this is super weird. I, I, never, I never experienced anything like it. All to say that as God, as a producer, he's also... The director. The director knows when things should go. He knows the cues. He knows the signs of what people should do, how things should roll, what you should sound like. He knows the script and how everything goes and flows as a director. He memorizes everything. He knows when to say, okay, your line, your line, your turn, lights, everything, right? And so where do we see that? Here. Let's go from verse 13. Now, this is a servant who's there looking for the wife of Isaac. <coughs> it reads, See, I am standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, Please let down your jar, that I may have a drink. And she says, Drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And look what happens, verse 15 right after. Before he had finished praying, before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. Fast forward a little bit. Drink, my Lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. And you see what happens after, right? It doesn't end there. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. If that's God not knowing the directions or the cues, I don't know what is. Before he had even finished praying, the answer was there, present. So with God as a producer, he understands the background of everything. With God as a director, he knows what the vision is. He knows what needs to happen at the exact time. He knows the cues. He knows the signs. He knows every little thing that takes place after that. You know, a lot of it really doesn't make sense to us. Because we are just actors, right? We haven't thought about the whole plot. We haven't thought about the whole thing. We just read our scripts. But with God as a director, he knows what's next. He knows what needs to happen. And in his time, and it's perfect each and every time. So what am I saying here? What are we getting at with God as a producer and with God as a director of your movie, 
that, by the way, is scripted, it's in scripture, the answer is here, what does that look like in dating? Let's take a look. You see, in dating, what we're forced to see and to hear is Hollywood's look at life and love. We see it on social media, celebrities saying, oh, this is how we love each other. This is what love looks like. This is what they feed us to know about life and love, right? This is, you see it on social media, which is just in, like in the world we live in. That's just how it is, unfortunately. But don't follow Hollywood's formula of life and love. Don't do that. Instead, we follow Jesus in the model of, of prayer and active obedience. And by that, I mean we know the relationship that Jesus Christ has with the church. It's here in the script. The way that he loves the church, it's covered, it is showered with prayer for wisdom. But it's also included with an act of obedience to the producer of the, of the movie. Right? You have to know what the vision of the producer is. And you do that by reading the script. You do that by reading the script. When you know this, you understand what the producer wants in your movie. You understand what the producer wants for you, what he has designed for you in your movie through the script. So pray hard, pray truthfully, and obey the script. Lastly, pray that God provides a mentor for you. You know, it's hard because we, we again, we look for places where to look. How does love work? Who do we ask? What do we read? What do we watch? You can't realistically look for advice for someone who has not gone through it. It's just lying, just blind leading the blind, unfortunately. And so this means we have to pray that the Lord provide someone who is ready to disciple you <coughs> and to sharing what the script says about dating. You know the, the example of, of Miles Morales and Peter Parker is so weak when you're talking about mentorship. Because even Peter Parker, who's been Spider-Man for years, he's not perfect. Right? So how would you come to grips when the person who you're looking up to, doesn't know what they're doing. And this is a bold statement, but if you are going to be discipled by someone who God sends, I pray and hope that that person can honestly tell you, as Paul has said, to imitate me as I imitate Christ. The way that I love people, the way that I love my wife, it should be so apparent to you that you see Jesus in the way that he loves his church. That he's ready to die for his church. To sacrifice himself for the church. So as we look to what the Bible says about dating, it's not very explicit, to be honest with you. But the principles are there that we need to be in prayer full, covered in prayer, that we need to obey what the script says. Because it's already written. 
It's already there. Follow the script. Pray. Even now, for those who are single, even now, pray for your partner. And then look for a mentor, someone who's going to cycle you, to help lead you to the right people, to the right partner. Scripted. It's already here. I just want you to see that God is a producer and a director. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the script. That every answer to every question known is already here. Even in terms of dating and in life and love, it's here. So we pray that we step down. We pray that we look to you as a producer of our film, of our life, and say, show me what you want. Show me what you want for me through the script. We pray that we understand that you are the director of our life, that we also step down and say, God, you are directing this. Not me, not us, it's you. We pray that we be honest with each other that our prayers be true and that we seek what you want for us in the script. We pray that you bring a community around us to help pass their wisdom down, pass their wisdom from the script, not of this world, but from what they have learned through the producer and the director that is God, that is you. We pray that those people rise up to disciple this generation. We pray that we see Jesus in every relationship, that we see the love that was given to the point of death, that somebody would love me enough to die for me. Not because I was good, not because I was perfect, but because they were good, because Jesus was good, because Jesus was perfect, that I would want to love people like Jesus loved people. That dating is not just a joke or something we play with toy with, but it's something that's written out. We pray that the script be dear to our hearts, be dear to our minds, our souls. <coughs> pray that it's you. That it's you that produces and directs our life. Our movie, if you will. So be with us and guide us going forward. In Jesus' name we pray.